Hi everyone, welcome back to Brookdale Farm. We're just about ready for harvest. Uh, the last major job to do before we start is to service the harvester. This is a New Holland TR88. The TR on it stands for twin rotors. And I'll show you them in a minute. Um, this machine I think is from the mid 1990s. It's one of the newest pieces of equipment that we actually have on the farm. And I've only had this for a short time. Um, we got this uh, and you, we used it last year for the first time. Uh, and it went really well. It made things a huge amount quicker than the old machine. It also uses about three times as much fuel, which is a little bit of a disadvantage. Um, but it's a really nice, comfortable machine um, to use, and uh, it gets the job done a lot quicker, uh, which also means I can do a little bit of contracting with it. Now, the twin rotors are the threshers inside the front here. Oh. So it doesn't have the grain front on it at the moment. I'll show you that in a little while. Um, the grain gets taken up these broad elevators in the front here, um, along with all the straw and chaff and everything else. And it goes up into, into here. And there's two of these big rotor drums here, which are the, the thresher and uh, the separator. Now the New Hollands are a little bit unusual in that they have two of them. Um, people say the maintenance are very high on these machines because they have two of everything. Uh, the big case machines just have one single large drum down through the centre here which works quite well um, but this is the machine that I had available to me. Uh, now there is a plate that goes over here that's got the thresher bars in it. So this is the thresher in here. Um, it's got um, big heavy steel bars that run this way with lighter steel wires that run around it. Now depending on the grain that you are harvesting, you can change the number of wires that are in here and the spacing between them. You want the grain to fall down between here and you want all the straw to keep moving up and out the back. These are the, um, the thresher plates. They rub everything against the wires in, in there and the bars in there. And this is what helps break the heads up and separate the grain out. Now, then the grain, once the grain has fallen through here, it goes, moves out the back here. So in the back here, we've got a number of what are called frog mouth screens. Um, there's a big fan underneath here that blows air up through these screens and you can change the, um, how, how the gap between each of these bits. So if, as you change the gap, it changes the way the air flows over them and also the, um, the size of the grain that will drop down between them. So these are really great. The older machines didn't have these, they just had a set sized screen that you, you and you had to pull the whole screen out and put another screen in when you were changing grains. <coughs> um, so the theory is that the grain all falls down through here and the straw all gets blown over the back. Now there is another screen in here underneath everything that falls through here is clean grain with supposedly nothing else in it everything that has fallen through the top screen but is too big to go through this one falls off the end here and goes back through the thresher again um, and this is just to help break up anything that doesn't get threshed properly the first time So after the grain has been processed and separated out, it comes up into this tank here which is just behind the driver's cab. Um, it comes up through this big auger here and fills up this tank. There is a cover to go over that big hole over there. Um, it's uh, been taken out so that I can get access for maintenance and things like that. Um, so we're going to get on now and start doing the servicing to this machine. 
So one of the first pieces of maintenance that we always start with on this every year is to go through and grease it. And there's grease nipples everywhere. One thing they have done that's made it a little bit easier on these is there's a sticker here next to each grease nipple with a picture of a grease gun and this one has 10 hours on it. So this one we know needs to be greased every 10 hours. These ones up here are every 50 hours. These ones down here, this one here is every 100 hours. Um, so it really helps with your maintenance. You don't have to go away and look up how often you need to grease them. It's just there and you can work out which ones you need to do every day and which ones you do it every week and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to go through and grease this now. One of the jobs that we have to do this year is um, in here on this final drive housing last year I was leaking a lot of oil out of here. So we're just going to whip this cover off uh, and make up a new gasket for it and reseal it. Um, so I'm going to get on and do that now. Um, I don't know that you're going to be able to see an awful lot of it because I don't know how I'm going to set the camera up. Um, but I'll show you some of the steps as we go through. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is lay the cover over the top of it. I'm going to bring it to just on the edge there. And mark out around the edge of it. At this point we also just want to mark out where the holes in it go. Now, because the holes are a fair way in from the edge on here, I am actually going to cut out the gasket first. Um, often I will punch the holes first because particularly on paper gasket, where it can get a bit brittle and split, you want to do the smallest, make the, the smallest holes first. Um, anything with a wad punch needs to be done first, basically. Um, this stuff is a little bit more forgiving and these holes are a fair way in from the edge so it's not so likely to split. Most gasket material you can cut just with an ordinary pair of scissors. Some of the exhaust gasket stuff has tin in the middle of it or um, wire reinforcing, um, that can be really hard to cut. Um, sometimes I find a pair of tin snips are about the best for that. Okay, that looks pretty good. Just going to turn it over and make sure all our holes line up. Okay, this is the wad punch kit I have um, for cutting out gaskets. These are fantastic. You get a whole bundle of different sizes. Um, these have a sharpened end on them and a handle that's supposed to screw onto them. There's threads on this one stripped now. Um, now when you're using, if you can get yourself a set of wad punches, they're really great tools, really handy to have. When we're using these, ideally we want a piece of hardwood, this is pine so this is a bit soft, and we want to be punching onto the end grain, not across it. Um, this will make your punches last a lot longer if you can, uh, and give you a, the best cut. Um, there's a little spring-loaded piece in the middle here, um, which is a pointer to the center of your hole, but it also helps push the, the piece that you cut out out of it. So we just push down on it, get it back with the hammer, and we end up with a nice round hole and the little bit left over. So I'm just going to work around now and punch all of these out. We don't need to hit it very hard. The cork is a pretty soft material. Okay, now for the more tricky part. We've cut out the outside, we've punched the holes. Um, we still need to cut out the inside and it can be a bit hard to work out where to cut that sometimes. There's no sharp edge on here to mark on, um, particularly on the ends here. We're just going to have to have a bit of a guess as to where it, where it should go. Sometimes I oil up this surface and then lay the gasket down on there. 
um, and that marks it out quite nicely where it needs to go. Um, today we're just going to feel around and put a couple of marks on it and then try and trace around it. Okay, so now we just want a straight line between all of those marks. <coughs> and that should be pretty good. Now the gasket starts to get a little bit fragile at this point um, because we now only have narrow bits of material left once we've cut this out so we need to be quite careful with it that we don't tear it um, or we've got to start again. Now, if you've got bits like this that you've cut out of the centre, it's a good idea to keep them. You'll probably be able to make a smaller gasket for something else out of, out of what you've got uh, there. And there we go. Um, I'm going to go and clean up the surfaces now and uh, we'll uh, come back and we'll fit this up. Okay, so I've cleaned up both the faces on on the um, on the covers. Um, I like to just run around them with a bit of petrol once I've cleaned them down. I'm going to be using some um, some of this elastic on it again just to hold it together. I don't need much of that. This, if I put enough of this on, I could pretty much glue these two covers together uh, and not need any bolts on it. This is pretty good stuff. Um, it's not particularly good to get on you though, so try and avoid touching it. <coughs> and put a bit more um, elastic on the gasket. I'm sorry if this isn't all quite in frame on the camera. It's quite crowded in here and it's a bit hard to find anywhere to put the camera that you can uh, see what you need to The elastic also helps it stay in place so that we can lift the cover into place without the gasket falling off Now cork is a really soft gasket material, um, 
and particularly with the thicker cork, this is quite thin cork this stuff, um, but with the thicker cork you can actually squash the cork right out of the um, between the two surfaces if you do it up too tight. Um, so I'm just going to nip this up to just a little bit more than finger tight now and I will come back and tighten it down when the celastic has dried. This will help to hold the cork in the right spot between the two surfaces as well um, and hopefully we'll get a good seal on it and it won't leak this year. So the next piece of maintenance is we have six gearboxes and the two final drives to check the oil in. This gearbox here for the feeder housing is the smallest of the gearboxes um, and there's a level plug down here. Now unfortunately on the, a lot of these little gearboxes on here, they don't have a drain plug on them. So I'm just going to try and suck some of the oil out of this so that we can do at least a partial oil change. Okay, this is the main gearbox here and this is the level plug on it. So we'll just open that up. And I changed all of these oils last year. Uh, so we won't be changing the main gearboxes again this year. That's right on the right level, so we'll put that uh, that plug back in and go and have a look at the two rotor gearboxes. So to check the oil level in the two rotor gearboxes, we're back up here in the grain bin and we've got to climb down through the maintenance hole in it. Poke our heads down here next to the engine. And there's two gearboxes here, one here and one down in here. Now these both have have a dipstick in the the filler plug here. Um, not sure if I'm going to be able to do this one-handed. So this one should be pretty good. Yep, that's got plenty of oil in it. I know that the other one's leaking, um, so I'm going to put the camera down and uh, sort that one out, and uh, then we'll go and uh, f probably fill up that last final drive. While we're walking around this machine doing all of the checks, I thought I'd just show you the amount of wear on the tyre here. Now this is... Uh, the tyres are really good, they've still got good lugs on them, um, but the canola stubble, when you're harvesting canola, is really abrasive and it really wears in underneath the tyres here and in these spots here. Um, one of these tyres was actually worn through to the canvas and I had to replace it with another second hand one last year. Um, it's just interesting how much um, wear the um, the canola stubble can do on uh, on a big heavy piece of rubber like this. The next thing we need to do um, is change the hydraulic oil which is in this small tank here up the front. Uh, the drain bung is down here and there's a filler up the top there somewhere um, and this hydraulic filter under here. Now these, uh, this set of hydraulics runs the reel on the front which helps to feed uh, the crop into the front when it's uh, when we're harvesting. Um, so I'm going to drain that next.
Okay, and the new filter goes on. Whenever we change filters, we always want to put just a smear of oil around the um, the seal. Um, this just helps it a not to rip the seal when you screw it on, and b it helps it come undone again when you want to change it. Um, I have seen these seals stick on pretty hard sometimes, and you just about destroy the filter trying to get the filter off. Okay, the last things we need to do to this to get it ready before we wash out the, wash the wind, windows so we can see where we're going um, is lubricate the chains. Now, one of the um, I've been using chain lube. I've tried a couple of different brands. I'm not that happy with it. These chains here got a good dose last year, um, and they've gone rusty so I don't know that it's much better than oil um, I'll give it a go one last time and uh, then we'll try something different um, one of the best ways to lube the chains is to put everything in gear and just run it over at idle at really low speed um, and just give them a good spray as you're going This is the front that goes on our harvester. It's 30 feet wide. At the moment it's on the comb trailer for transport. Uh, there's a little bit of maintenance we've got to do to this, but most of it we can't do until we've got it on the harvester. Um, so we've got gearboxes here, uh, one on each side, and we've got to check the oil levels in them, um, but it needs to be sitting a bit more level than that, than it, than it currently is. Um, there's a few uh, grease nipples on the two shafts round on this side um, and there's a little rust hole in here that I've just got to patch up um, but uh, it, we're just about ready to start harvesting so I'm going to get on and do this and I'm going to leave you and uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope to see you again next week when we will actually be harvesting thanks, bye